I'm Emily. And I'm Hannah. We are best friends and dietitians. We have a goal of challenging nutrition misinformation and fitness trends with an evidence-based approach. Each episode, we will dish up our thoughts about the latest facts on a popular health-related topic. Where are the upbeat dietitians? All right, everyone. Today's episode, we'll be doing another edition of Myth or Fact Fitness Edition. And we are joined by two previous guests, Brendan and Damien. If you listen to episodes 11 and 16, you probably, these names sound familiar to you. And if not, go back and listen to those after this episode. Brendan and Damien are both personal trainers. They both work currently in the fitness world. So they really gave a great perspective on some very common fitness myths. So if you guys are wanting more perspective on the fitness side of things, this is a great episode for you. Enjoy. Right. Enjoy. <laughs> All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Uppy Dietitians podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the pod. Today, we are joined by two guests you have heard from before. We have two of our favorite fitness, I don't want to say influencers, it sounds like a bad thing, fitness trainers, Damien and Brendan. So guys, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Okay, well, we will jump right in. Today we're talking about um, fitness myths. Emily and I had a podcast on this earlier this season. I forget what episode it was, but we'll link it down in the description, Um, but that was just from our perspective. So today we want to get a perspective from some uh, uh, personal trainers and see their thoughts on controversial fitness questions as well. So let's get right into it. Our first one is the myth that men and women should do different types of exercise. So guys, what are your thoughts on this one? We got a thumbs down from Brendan. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a dub. That's a double thumbs, thumbs, oh, thumbs down. Oh, double thumbs down. down. We're doubling down on this. That's right. Okay, that's right. Dame, you want to go first or? Yeah, sure. I got you, man. So with this, I always like to try my best to like find the origin of them so we can kind of understand like the context, right? Um, this one, from my understanding, is kind of just like a, I guess you could say, stereotypical cultural thing of like men do this, women do this. And of course, like go on and on whole other podcasts people smarter than me talking about men and women differences but overall when it comes to training like what we see is that men and women tend to respond pretty much the exact same way when you equate things like body composition in terms of muscle mass right so i think the origin is like hey women need to have the hourglass figure men need to be wide at the shoulders and narrow at the hips right so that's kind of like the perception of oh you want to look like this you got to train this way when in reality, training should just be based on like your goals, your preferences, your timetable, et cetera. So anyone who says like, hey, you're a woman, so like you can't do these exercises or you're a man, this is gonna be better for you. Um, Number one, that's not true. So I wouldn't, I would, you know, caution that advice. And then number two, like I mentioned, like we got some cool research that shows like guys or girls, like people might say like, oh, women because of testosterone, it's hard to gain muscle mass. No, actually I'll I'll throw a study to, to Hannah and Emily showing that if anything, from what we have, women might do a little bit better with getting stronger or gaining muscle mass, relatively speaking, right? Obviously, you're not going to get more jacked than a stereotypical man, but you have a maybe a greater capacity, if not equal across the board. That's interesting. I did not know about that correlation there. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, the study, it was like a small effect size, and I'm going to guess it was probably just like an outlier of that study, but it kind of it's cool to see that because it's just kind of like a spit in the face of like that kind of myth. It's like, Hey, it all overall probably is equal. It's just in this one example, look, it was even higher. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, take that bro. Brendan, what are your thoughts on this question or this myth? Yes, absolutely. First I'll say, this is why that Damien trains me because that man just knows his stuff. Uh, I will say I have a couple physique clients where I work right now that they do want to look like a very specific way. So I will have some of my female clients that want to look like that hourglass shape, do some things that are obviously different than what I have my guys that want to look like big arms, wide, broad shoulders, you know, certain clients want specific physiques and like most bodybuilders will do, you will just work those muscle groups a little bit more than the others. So, uh, 
you will only really be training differently, like Damien said, for your goals specifically, but it's not going to be a, a, a gender issue here. It's going to be, what do I want to look like? What do I want to grow? And then how do I implement that? So I literally have like an hourglass program just in a way that I made for some of my clients where they do a lot of lats, they do a lot of glutes. That's what they want to grow. So they hit that like three times a week compared to like the normal two. So that's pretty much my two cents for what Damien didn't already cover in great detail. So uh, it will matter, but for your specific goal, not just like, am I a guy? Am I a girl? Right. Like you could have a guy do that hourglass figure style workouts if they wanted to, but I know most guys aren't looking for that hourglass figure. So that's where the discrepancy is for sure. Booty for the yeah. boys. We got to We got to start. Trying. <laughs> Hey, real, man, real men, guys. real men, real men hip thrust five hundred pounds. So, yeah. <laughs> Brendan's, well, that's right. Six hundred. Thank you. You are so my, my apologies. You wrote the program. <laughs> no, I'm in it, boy. My bad. <laughs> Not expecting this to become a hip thrusting competition, but I'm glad that it. We are pro hip <laughs> Glad that it has. You never know what direction it's going to go with Brendan and Damien. That's so true. <laughs> Absolutely. So, kind of then going into our next myth to debunk is you should exercise in the morning for the best results. I think I've heard a lot about timing of exercise and I'm typically, I know Hannah and I talk a lot about it from like probably a nutrition feeling perspective, like eating around that, but from the perspective of getting the most out of your workout, is this statement true? So I'm sure Damien, like we were in the last question, we'll cover a lot more of the science behind this. The man reads way more research studies than I could even fathom. Uh, essentially, my two cents on the subject is it depends on how intense your goals are and what kind of fitness goals you're like aiming to achieve. If you're just looking to start out and you're not a morning person, do not work out in the morning. Go after work when you feel like you're going to want to go. Find what works in your schedule and your routine that will get you in there first and then if you're like, oh, cool, I just enjoy working out. I don't care what time of the day it will be. Then you can start to go into the, the little nitty gritty details of all these studies that will benefit you in the long run. But it's so minuscule. It's not a detail we need to worry about when first getting into the gym, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally agree. It's like, that's what we always say about almost every topic, Emily, is like, just find what works for you. Like, if you don't like broccoli, don't eat broccoli. Have another green vegetable instead. Like, there's no one perfect way to do it. but you're right. Damien will probably be the one to go over like the science behind why there are certain times that are beneficial. If you are one who is genuinely curious, like, I don't care if I go in the morning or later in the day, just tell me which one might be better for me. Yeah, absolutely. And first off, Brendan is really smart and he actually simplifies things a lot better than I do. So, you know, take that for what that's worth, but kind of to go into like the reasoning why, cause I couldn't have said it better myself. Like when you think about, you know, again, going back to the origin, right? Where does this kind of idea come from when people say like, you got to exercise in the morning or maybe it's better at night, right? Where does that idea come from? Um, in my experience, it's been like a hormonal thing. Um, typically I see it, you know, I, I don't haven't seen too much regard for women. Maybe I'm just like biased in the, in the media I consume, but I've seen it a lot with men where it's like your testosterone is genuinely high in the morning, although it can fluctuate throughout the day. Um, but also other hormones like insulin and cortisol, they have different times in which they fluctuate. So if I train at a certain time and I can maximize those things, will that promote better gains, right? It's kind of like the big thing. Am I maximizing adaptation? So I'm going to focus on three main ones real quick, uh, testosterone, insulin, and cortisol, uh, insulin, of course, not necessarily being a, a hormone per se, but focusing on those three, I guess, physiological aspects of your body. So testosterone is a tricky one. Um, the first big thing to think about is like, you know, this is a whole other, you know, podcast, but hormone levels fluctuate so much throughout the day. And then the range for certain ones is so ridiculous. Um, I'm not a doctor first and foremost, and, you know, I'm not reading people's testosterone levels, but testosterone for men can range roughly between 300 to about 900 nanograms per deciliter. That's a really big window, right? Um, and if I read your testosterone at one point, in one point, part of the day, and then at another point of the day, it could be drastically different. Um, so this is what makes it complicated, like with, you know, TRT or like finding out someone has low T, right? It's, it's not as simple as one blood test, you're low, and then it's, you know, you get medicated. So the premise is, oh, testosterone is generally high in the morning. And 
so that I should work out because testosterone's high, right? That's tricky. Um, there's a lot of things that can boost testosterone. Um, this may sound a little silly. And again, these are just some examples of studies, but not to take it with a grain of salt, but things like certain stimulants can temporarily boost testosterone, caffeine, nicotine. Um, so technically, if you want to get down, there is the potential where smoking a cigarette can boost your testosterone in a short span of time. Now, does that mean that uh, cigarette smoking is anabolic and you're going to gain muscle mass? Absolutely not, right? So understanding that short-term, yeah, proceed, no. Understanding that like short-term boost in uh, hormones does not mean long-term gains. It's just a fluctuation throughout the day. Uh, insulin kind of, you know, I'm sure Ann and Emily can talk about this in greater detail than I can, but you can think about it as, you know, simply as your body's way of regulating sugar. And it's looked at as kind of like this anabolic uh, assister in your body. I believe some people even use it as kind of a supplement or a substitute for steroid, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it is high post meals. Uh, so again, like depending on the time of day, it changes. And again, it may not really matter like when you train for insulin, if that's what you're looking for. And then last one's cortisol, stress hormone, as we know about it. Uh, he gets a bad, he gets the bad rap when he's actually a, a very important hormone for our body. There's even some research showing that, you know, maybe cortisol helps with the muscle remodeling process, which we need to grow. So people always think cortisol is bad. I want to work out when it's low. But when you work out, your cortisol goes up no matter what you do, and then it might help with the repair process. So wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, so big takeaway, just because your hormones are elevated or lower acutely doesn't mean it has any impact chronically. Oh, so good. That stuff, like hormones, I just don't love them. I like feel as a dietitian, I have to like really master them. And I just, it's so oh, overwhelming yeah. to me, to be honest. So that was like mind blowing to me. I love that. That was so good. I see. So our next um, myth to debunk is a very popular one. So very simply put, are abs built in the kitchen or in the gym and why? We'll, 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 we'll rotate who goes first, Damien. How's that sound? So you go first this time. I thought I thought we were at that point in this relationship and this friendship, man, where like we already established that. I knew you were going next. So I was waiting for you, big dog. Oh, well, no, well, you would have gone next. If, yeah, Brendan went first last time. I'll just go. How's that sound, guys? <laughs> uh, I mean, so it's going to be both, right? Like, you can't just never activate your abdominal muscles and just eat super clean and expect to have, like, muscles pointed out. Abdominal muscles are still muscles. We have to remember that. Constantly people are like, oh, yeah, I just got to get a six-pack. Like, those are still muscles. You still need to, like work them like normal muscles. So if I'm trying to get a client that wants like better core strength, instead of giving them like starting with a one minute plank and then going to like a 20 minute plank that's working their muscular endurance, I'll put a plate on their back and have them work on strengthening those muscles with more weight, more resistance, just like normal muscles. So if you want them to pop a little bit, like you would with a bicep or a delt, you still need to activate them to a certain degree. Now, as a power lifter, I don't do a lot of core because I brace so hard at a lot of my lifts and have utilized that aspect of my core strength. If I'm doing a set of 12 on squats, I'm bracing my core for a while. Yeah, thanks, Damien. I know how that feels very recently. It sucks. Where like my abs hurt after a set of squats because I'm breathing so effectively with my core. So you have, to, you have to think about that in the gym, but also you can't, you can't outwork a bad diet. So you do have to be a decently low body fat percentage as well in order for your abs to show. I can't be, there are a lot of like strong men who they have a lot of fat on the outer side of their belly. So they don't look that they have abs, but their core strength is insane. So it's gotta be a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I agree. Definitely what Brendan said. I would say, you know, visible abs are built in both, right? So like, mm -hmm. you know, those, the strong men example was perfect. Like sometimes you can kind of see the outline of it, but at the end of the day, it's a training thing to emphasize them, but it's a body composition thing to visibly see them. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I would really add is there's a huge genetic factor to it. Um, some people just genetics plays a role in body composition, but it also plays a role in anatomy, right? Where some people it's like, you know, how close their skin is to their muscle and like the way that the whole water is different. Um, some people have a four pack and some people have an eight pack, like just genetically how it looks. So Genetics is kind of only that last other piece I'd add on top. Mm -hmm. One not often well, forgotten. I usually hammer that one home because it's huge. Some, yeah. some people just 
I've had abs since I was like born, essentially. I was a skinny kid that always had abs. Wow. And yeah, call me out. I, I, it's it's just a fact. Out, came out of the womb with yeah. a six pack. Oh, that was an image. <laughs> That made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean didn't mean like we're, we're talking like 13 on here. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That'd be great though. There are some like three-year-old kids that are like shredded because they're doing yeah. gymnastics already. It's yeah. the same. Oh yeah. Another podcast <laughs> for a different day. <laughs> oh, I can't even describe the visual that just put it into my head. <laughs> That's great. All right. Yeah, that was okay. great. Thank you guys for that one. Yeah, I think I'm really excited for this next myth that we'll talk about because I I think it's kind of up there. I think we might have talked about sweating in our last myth or fact one. And this, I feel like it kind of correlates with that just in the sense from a success rate. But the statement is, is DOMS a good indicator slash DOMS indicates a good workout. And as we learned last time, and I remember I struggled through this, what DOMS stood for, but it is delayed onset muscle soreness. Thank you, girl. HK classes. Really retaining that knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, is DOMS a good indicator for a good workout? Put it in one word, no. So... Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. it. <laughs> that's it. Done deal, right? Yeah, the the take home thing. People think like, well, Dom's I'm sore means it was hard. Means it was a good workout. And this is actually one of my pet peeves when it comes to programming. I always tell people anyone can make you puke or be sore. It takes a trainer to make a good program that's going to help you, right? So if I told you. No, we are all relatively fit. We work out somewhat regularly. If I said tomorrow we're doing, you know, a hundred burpees followed by an hour on the bike of like a heavy resistance, I guarantee you we'd all be pretty sore. Uh, does that mean that we're out of shape or that it, it was a, it was a good workout? No, it just means that it's a crap ton of work that we're not used to. And so that's what Dom's is, right? Dom's is that feeling of excess muscle damage. Um, not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's just you're new to training. Um, and then it was like, Hey, like that, this is what happens. It's to be expected. Um, but I always tell people, like, if you have a coach and you're programming, or if you're programming for yourself and after like two or three weeks, if you're still feeling like severe doms, check your program. Um, the only real times that you should have major changes is the first like couple of weeks you start. If you make a major change, like you go from like one type of training to another, like you swap out the exercise, you swap out the training parameters because it's a brand new stimulus. Um, or if there's just your programming is like all over the place and you have these huge jumps in training volume, you're changing the exercise every day, which probably isn't the best thing for a particular goal that you might be chasing. Oh, and the last thing I forgot to mention that I just thought of is, is if you got everything checked off, you're like, my program is good, everything like that. Maybe it, your recovery is not very good or like mm -hmm. you aren't sleeping or getting proper nutrition. Yeah, I was going to say nutrition. That's probably a big one too that is often neglected for sure. I'm glad you brought that up. We we literally have gone across that in my training with Damien since he makes my workout programs. I've been like, I feel like trash and I think it's my nutrition. I'll fix it for a couple of days and I'll be like, wow, I feel a lot better. My recovery feels a lot better. Isn't it crazy that what I put into my body can actually affect the way I feel and my performance? Wild. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. What are you guys' thoughts on people who say that the hardest part of like being a generally fit person is the nutrition. Do you agree with that? Or do you think it's more the fitness side of things, the exercise? Oh, that really just depends on what kind of person you are. Cause some people True. love to, I hate cooking for me. It is a hundred percent. I hate cooking. I literally just had fried chicken and fries before the podcast started. Like it's that's, that's like my cheat meal. I've been good the past like week. I felt a lot better. But nutrition's just tough for a lot of people. Some of us just don't like to cook or like we really like certain foods. Uh, but it's all about balance. Like I allow myself to eat that fried chicken because I've been good. I want a little snack. I'm not going to want fried chicken for a little while now because I usually don't feel great after. And it usually affects my performance. I will see how the squats go tomorrow, Damien. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> but yeah, but there, some people are just really good with cooking. They love to cook. And it, my mother's a great example. She just hates sweating. Like she doesn't like to sweat. So the actual workout portion of like that aspect is so much tougher. Whereas and she loves to cook. So she'll like cook something happily and it'll be healthy. 
but just can't actually do the workout. It, different people have different tastes. I feel like for most people who are working out fairly consistently, the harder part is going to be their nutrition because they usually just don't know what they're doing because not a lot of us truly have cooked amazingly our entire lives. Yeah. Yeah. Just I was just curious. curious. I, I see that on like TikTok a lot. They're like the hardest part of becoming a fitness guru or whatever isn't the gym, it's the nutrition. So I was just curious what you guys' thoughts were on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with Brendan. Yeah. Um, any more thoughts on Doms before we move on to our next one? No, Dame knocked it out of the park. So we can go ahead and move on. Okay. Sounds good. Um, this one's a good one too. I think they're all good ones. These are all very common questions, but I'm excited for your thoughts on this one as well. So question is, or I guess I'll put it in the form of the statement, the myth. Your knees shouldn't go past your toes when you squat. Why is this not true? I got this. So uh, have you ever noticed that people have different physiques and sizes and not everyone has even the same like size head? I got a bigger head than Damien does. Not everyone has the same bio. Like, so we can't just put it into an exact science where like, you need to be here, 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 here. We have our guidelines, but we do not. There's no specific form that's going to work for every individual person. We just have some really good tips and cues uh, that are the best for performance and safety. Like, I'm definitely not going to tell you to push your knees in when you squat. There are not going to be people that do that. That's where biomechanics breaks down to those severe severities. But some people just have incredibly long legs and like might have a large femur and their no, their t- knees might track over their toes when they squat. But then you ask your client, if, if I'm working with a client, so I'm a trainer, and I go, how'd that feel? And they're like, oh, it felt great. And then they never complain about knee pain because we're doing a program safely and effectively. Maybe their body just does that. And as long as they're doing the basic things like keeping their feet down when they squat, like their heels on the ground. If you're squatting on your toes and your knees are tracking over, that's probably going to be a lot of knee pressure. But essentially, each person is different. That's something to keep in mind with both nutrition and fitness in every realm is that every body is different. So you have to treat every body different. Yeah, I, I like it, man. The, um, the different anatomy is a big thing, but just I don't have data on this. So I got to speak anecdotally on this portion of it. And then I'll kind of go into like the origin of it is like, yeah, most people, when I watch them get past 90 degrees in their squat, their toes at the very least come or their knees come to the, where their toes are or go past. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just how it is. If you go, you know, below 90 degrees. Um, and yeah, the, the test I always give someone, like I I do this in my prep course sometimes, because a lot of people come in with that myth of like, oh yeah, your knees shouldn't track past your toes in a squat, a lunge, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, here's what I want y'all to do. I want y'all to take, we'll usually like go up to a a box or something that goes up to about knee height. Mm -hmm. And so that way their upper body can still move forward. And I'll say, I want y'all to squat, you know, put your toes up to that box. And I want you to squat without your knees touching that box. And all of them try and stay upright as best as they can. Eventually their knees touch or they have to like, you know, fall backwards. So from a balance perspective, like the knees for most people will just eventually track forward to kind of balance out their, you know, the back part of their body and, and the femur tracking forward. Um, the origin of this kind of, this is actually has a direct origin, which is pretty cool. Um, there is a Duke study out in 1978 looking at cheering forces. Cheering forces, if I remember correctly, are uh, compression going down and then moving uh, perpendicular to each or parallel to each other, excuse me. So once they're down and then they go here. So kind of like this, you can think of like almost like a grinding action, um, which sounds bad when you think about it. Um, and it was thought that, well, because the shearing force on the knee is extremely high when they go past the toes, that must be bad for the knee joint. Um, so my question here is number one, why is stress bad? Um, because whenever we go to the gym and we train ourselves, we stress our body. So I think there's a, there's an issue with saying that stress on a particular joint is bad. I think we have this fear when it comes to exercise that putting stress or pressure on your back, on your disc, on your elbows, on your shoulders is bad. No, it's not. Your body is meant to deal with stress and you adapt through stress. The issue is stress that isn't regulated properly, meaning you don't you know, progress over time in a gradual way. You go from never training before to throwing 135 on the bar and you squat 
you know, ass to grass for 10 reps. And you're like, wow, my knees hurts because my knees went past my toes. Like, no, it's because you squatted ass to grass and you haven't done it before. Right. So that study kind of caught fire and they're like, wow, shearing force greater than when you don't go past your toes. This isn't good. Um, but biomechanically, if you want to get better benefit from your exercise, you train the full range of motion. And if you train with the stress properly, you'll actually have greater adaptations. Um, I also saw another study, I, I can't remember the name of it exactly, exactly, but they were also looking at like during the, the hip joint, if you don't go past your toes, the stress, the sheer stress on your hip joint goes up by an absurd amount. I think it's like, yeah, I got it right here. It's about a thousand percent increase in sheer force. So if you don't go past your toes, your hip gets the stress. If you do go past your toes, your knee gets the stress. So it's like, if that's true, you lose either way. So then what, just don't lift. No, it's silly. <laughs> Yeah. Double-edged sword for sure. I feel like this podcast is going to be great for people who lift weights or want to lift weights and have these common questions. And also for like maybe new trainers who like didn't know why your knee shouldn't go past your toes. So a lot of good target audiences here. So this is great. Okay. We have one last myth to debunk and this one really probably isn't much science. There isn't a lot of science that needs to be talked about to answer this, but the myth is that the step machine, so you guys know at the gym, like the stair stepper thing where you're just like walking on stairs in one area for however long, is that the best for, shall I say, hashtag booty goals? Interesting. <laughs> so I, I thought, personally, I thought when you said the step machine, I was thinking, for some reason, I always see people do like the assisted chin dip and they like step down on it. Oh, which is kind of like the same thing. Oh, I mean, that's the same motion. Is it you're not? talking like you're talking like a, a stair master, the stair right? Like master, yeah, like yeah. The cardio, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, you you will put a specific amount of volume in your glutes when you do it. However, when you're doing it, you're probably working for muscular endurance because you are constantly stepping. Unless you're someone who does like take a step up, for example, you do a weighted step up. That's going to help you so much more build muscle because. It's, you're going to add weight and add more weight over time. Whereas unless you're adding weight to your Stairmaster workouts. Oh my God. <laughs> but awesome. then once you, once you get to a certain amount of time, you're going to be working so much more aerobically and it's not going to be as good for muscle building specifically. So again, kind of like my uh, abs answer where I like give my clients weighted planks instead of just progressing their plank and length, if they want to build muscle is you want to do things that are more effective where you build volume over time in those muscle groups where you will probably see a small amount of booty gains when you still do muscular endurance and you keep going on that stair master and you're really tucking your hips and activating those glutes while you go up but it's not going to be the most effective in the shortest amount of time but you will have some people that have seen some progress with it because of their genetics just what they're doing and like imagine if they were doing the right things how much faster they could or how much more muscle they could gain and you'll have those people do those because it's it's easy to just hold on. It's easier to just hold on to a machine for 20 minutes and just like zone out doing the exact same thing than it is to lift some heavier weights when you're not used to it, especially and progressively go heavier and heavier over time. I have to worry about a bunch of other stuff. So it will be effective, but just not as effective as a lot of other things could be. And I wouldn't recommend if you're trying to grow your glutes specifically, do some hip thrusts. Right. And do some actual weighted step ups. Weighted step ups are another great one. You can activate a lot of glute in a weighted step up. Same motion, just you're progressing it toward muscle building instead of muscular endurance and or curvascular endurance. Step ups are killer. Like those, I never really feel it in the glutes unless I do a, a step up like that. Those get me going. I also really like how you mentioned that it seems much easier to just do it for like 20 minutes because I feel like Stairmaster is pretty straightforward. You just mm -hmm. go up just go. the stairs. Walk up the and stairs. then most of us have done it. Yeah. But like actually step ups and hip thrusts that takes a bit more knowing about like where should I place the bars or where how should I be holding weights? Um mm -hmm. and what that's weight not, do I use? Yeah, that's not quite as straightforward user friendly mm -hmm. as a stairmaster. Weights are also becoming, I guess, more of the norm nowadays than they used to be. But I mean, for years, most of us, we're all in our 20s, right? 
years ago, <laughs> I have some trainers that I work with that are like, they're like 30s, 40s. And they're like, yeah, I mean, cardio was just like what we had a lot of our clients do. It was just go, 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 go. And to learn more science that even for fat loss, muscle building is very, very effective. And a lot of my clients see some fat loss with their muscle building goals just because weightlifting is actually really effective for both. So we've changed our knowledge a lot. And like stairs are good cardio. So when that machine was brought in, it was very well thought just, oh, cool. It's just like, it's comfortable. It's familiar, like a treadmill. You're just walking. You're just walking upstairs. It's, it's very easy to just correlate that with the easiest way to go about things mentally, which plays a big part in a lot of people's programs. Damien, anything to add to the hashtag booty goals? Yeah, I think Brendan summarized it really, really well. Yeah, like anytime you want to work the glutes, you got to go into hip extension or external rotation. So going upstairs, you flex and then you extend and stuff, right? Um, can definitely work for a little bit, but all the exercises that Brendan mentioned, the hip thrust, the step up, the lunge, the squat, um, you're going to get better range of motion, like in a step up, unless it's a really high step or you have short, really short legs, like you're probably not going to get a full like hip flexion and then extension. So I would argue that maybe the range of motion isn't best on that, but you'll get some benefit for a little bit, but I would be more of an advocate of like, let's do some, some, some squats some hip thrusts, and you can do like some smaller, you know, like what they would call like booty exercises externally, like, you know, donkey kicks, um, fire hydrants, et cetera, for like other aspects of it. Okay. I'm excited for this question today. Um, last time we had Brendan on for a bonus question, it did not go as planned. So hoping today is less messy. Damien, did you happen to see what happened in that one? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember what happened to be honest. <laughs> you spilled, you spilled sauce all over your computer. Remember? Oh, that's right. No. Yeah, I was eating canes that day too. I just had canes, the exact same chicken <laughs> oh tonight that I did in that podcast. That's did awesome. you ruin your computer? Was it a different computer? Did you ruin it or? I, it was a different computer, but it was also like fine. I just had to clean okay. it up. But in the middle of it, I just like spilled it all over my keyboard. I was like, oh my God. He was like showing the camera and then he like tilted it and it got everywhere. <laughs> it was awful. Oh yeah, because it was about what, what's the, what restaurant has the best type of sauce. Yes. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. got to be Raising Cane's and they just spilled it everywhere. And you were just so excited <laughs> that you had it to show and then it just got yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Cause I had just gotten to Raising Cane's. I just tried it for like the first time. I was so happy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, today's bonus question is, does ketchup belong on a hot dog? And we have our guests go first. So you guys can kind of fight over who wants to talk about this, but what are your answers? Is this, is this a controversial thing? I mean, hell yeah, it goes on a hot dog, man. It depends on which region you live in. I think that's the thing. I feel oh, like- is that, is that a Midwest thing? Like different places do different things kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Uh-oh. A specific city like Chicago might uh -huh. not be very happy if I were to say anything <laughs> yeah. with hot ketchup on hot dogs. In Chicago, it just doesn't happen. So now that I live here, I legally have to say no. Yeah, However, I, I did it all the time when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I know just that. Type in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> type in the chat. Yeah, I knew that Emily and Brendan would likely have a particular answer about this. I think I raised to say ketchup should not be on a hot dog because that's not a Chicago style hot dog. Chicago style hot dogs do not have ketchup. But I'm also someone who likes everything physically possible on hot dogs. So <laughs> that kind of overpowers my childhood. I don't know what I've been taught. <laughs> so I say it does belong on it, but um, I know every Chicago hot dog place would disagree. I feel like we had a best pizza episode too, and things got controversial there too, in terms of Chicago style yeah. versus others. <laughs> yeah. So why don't people from Chicago like catch from the hot dog? Like, you don't, don't sounds... talk about it, Damien. I don't, <laughs> don't... I want all the smoke. They will care. they'll just scream, dog bears are better and ketchup does not belong on hot I dogs. Don't care. And you just got to run at that point. You just got to <laughs> make sure you get out of there. Is there like some history behind this? Did someone like get murdered by a tomato? Like what's going on? <laughs> you just don't do it. It's like an unspoken thing. You just don't what, do yeah. it. What goes on it then? Does anything go on it? You do mustard, mustard relish. Mustard. They put a bunch of stuff on okay, hot Okay, that's good. Oh, yeah. Chicago, no ketchup. Chicago hot dogs are the best hot dogs. They are. If, oh, yeah. We have to admit that. However, yeah. like do your thing. Put your ketchup on it. Just don't be seen by someone in my city. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I am from Auburn, Indiana, where we just do boring ketchup mustard relish on a hot dog. So I'm absolutely all about it. I have no affiliation with Chicago or any other fancy hot dog kind of place. So <laughs> team ketchup. We all agreed. <laughs> yeah, that was way easier than mm-hmm. the fast food sauce one. That got that got messy. <laughs> What was our question for yours, Damien? I can't remember. We had you on so our, long ago. It was our muffins bread? No. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What was it? Muffins bread? It was about was muffins. Cup- what was it? Our, our muffins, muffins cupcakes? cupcakes? Oh. oh, yeah. That's right. right. That's right. I don't remember what I said, but I'm sure I have a different thought on that now. I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> Wiser. <laughs> Wiser. Exactly. I- <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you guys so, so much for being on the podcast today. Before we let you go, let us know or let our listeners know where they can find you if they want to hear more about what you got to say. You can find me on Instagram at body by Brendan underscore 49. That's it. (laughs) That's it. That's that's the only place that I want you to. (laughs) Y'all can find me at uh, on Instagram and TikTok at the underscore shift underscore method. If you're interested in any kind of apparel, like you see me and Hannah rocking, you can go to the shiftmethod.org. We got hats, we got shirts, anything you want. We probably got it. And of course, I do personal training. I do in person down in Boca Raton. So if you're in South Florida, and you'd like to train with me, I'd love to work with you. Or if you want to do some online coaching, Brendan's a perfect example. He's up in Chicago right now, but I'm programming for him. Regardless of your goal, you want it, I can help you do it. So head to the shiftmethod.org, click one of those take action buttons, or just DM me on Instagram. I'd love to get working with you. We will link all those below too, in case you guys weren't able to get your fingers fast enough into the search bar while they were saying that. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, guys, for joining us once again. We'll have to do like a once a season kind of thing, maybe. We'll just always we'll have you guys be our go-to fitness. You'll people. be our our resident personal trainers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, let's go. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Hope you learned something and we will see you next week. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Later, y'all. Okay, bye. bye. Thank you so much for tuning in on this episode of the Upbeat Dietitians with your hosts, Emily Krause and Hannah Thompson. We appreciate you all so much for continuing to support us. In order to support us and sustain the success of this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to provide us feedback for future episodes and guest stars, follow us on Instagram at The Upbeat Dietitians. Lastly, you can show us support by providing a monthly donation using the link at the end of our bio. Once again, thank you so much for listening today and stay tuned next Wednesday for a new episode. Until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.